If you were to travel down the Rio Magdalena, just north of the Colombian capital of Bogota, you might come across some rather out-of-place wildlife, a herd of African hippopotamuses. The herd, which now numbers nearly a hundred, is descended from four individuals imported in the 1980s by notorious drug lord Pablo Escobar and kept in a private zoo on his estate in Puerto Triunfo. When Escobar was killed in 1993, the hippos escaped into the surrounding rivers and multiplied and multiplied and multiplied. The enormous invasive species then proceeded to wreak havoc on the local ecosystem, destroying local plant life, disrupting the habitat of native animals like crocodiles and manatees, and killing fish with copious amounts of noxious feces. If left unchecked, biologists fear the population could reach 1,000 by 2035, causing untold environmental damage. But as bizarre as this environmental crisis might seem, the exact same scenario might very well have played out in the United States more than 100 years ago, thanks to one of the strangest bills in U.S. congressional history. This is the wild and unlikely story of how the U.S. government tried to introduce hippo ranching to America. America's long-forgotten plan to introduce Africa's river horses to the swamps and byres of Louisiana was the brainchild of one Frederick Russell Burnham, a man so absurdly rugged, competent, and accomplished that his life reads more like an adventure novel than actual history. Born in 1861 in Minnesota, by age 14, Burnham had learned all the necessary skills to become a military scout, a combination of spy, tracker, and saboteur with no equivalent in modern warfare. To this end, he taught himself to ride, shoot left-handed on horseback, fight hand-to-hand, -hand, track, live off the land, and overcome extremes of heat, cold, and hunger. His exploits during the Apache Wars at the end of the 19th century earned him a reputation for near supernatural discipline, self-sufficiency, and familiarity with the land, leading to him being dubbed King of the Scouts and the most complete human being who ever lived. As journalist Richard Harding Davis wrote, he has trained himself to endure the most appalling fatigues, hunger, thirst, and wounds, has subdued the brain to infinite patience, has learned to force every nerve in his body to absolute obedience, to still even the beating of his heart. He reads the face of nature as you read your morning paper. His life is an endless chain of impossible achievements. In 1893, having run out of wars to fight in North America, Burnham sailed for South Africa and joined the British Army, serving in the First and Second Matabele Wars in 1894, in 1896 and the Second Anglo-Boer War from 1899 to 1902. During this period, Burnham also found the time to travel to Alaska to participate in the Klondike Gold Rush, though to his great disappointment, this prevented him from fighting in the Spanish-American War. In South Africa, Burnham once again earned a reputation for ruggedness and cunning, his many daring exploits including hiding in an aardvark burrow for two days while observing an enemy camp, floating down a river disguised as a cow carcass, and evading an enemy patrol despite being crushed by his horse. So impressed was one of his commanders, Major General Robert Baden-Powell, that he later claimed to have founded the Boy Scouts in the hopes of raising a generation of young men as competent as Burnham. And if that wasn't badass enough, nearly a century later, Burnham would serve as one of the main inspirations for the character of Indiana Jones. In 1910, Burnham's intimate knowledge of the African wilderness convinced him that hippos were the ideal solution to a major crisis then gripping the United States, a severe shortage of meat. In the early 20th century, the price of beef began to skyrocket as rangelands became depleted by overgrazing. In the past, the solution had simply been to expand further west, but by this time the frontier had long since been closed. There simply wasn't anywhere left to expand to. At the same time, the mass migration of Americans from the country side into cities along with massive waves of foreign immigration caused a surge in demand for meat, straining the meatpacking industry to its breaking point. The only solution, many concluded, was to somehow make productive lands which were unsuitable for cattle ranching. And that's where the hippos came in. On September the 19th, 1910, Frederick Burnham arrived at the Maryland Hotel in Pasadena and presented his ideas before the second annual convention of the Humane Association of California. Burnham's imaginative plan was to import thousands of edible African mammals, including animals antelopes and giraffes and release them onto the plains of the American Southwest, creating a new and hardy source of fresh meat for the growing American population. But the boldest part of Burnham's scheme involved introducing hippopotamuses into the swamps and byres of the American Gulf Coast, converting what had once been agriculturally unproductive land into a major source of protein. An official from the U.S. Department of Agriculture had already surveyed the region, including in his report that the byres are wildly dismal and forbidding. The silence strikes one with an almost unforgettable horror. Nonetheless, the hippopotamus would find no difficulty living in Louisiana. The official went on to estimate that even a small herd of hippos released into the bios of Louisiana, Florida, and Mississippi would quickly grow to yield nearly a million tons of meat a year. 
Furthermore, as hippos were too large and unruly to transport to the stockyards of Chicago, the scheme would force the construction of multiple regional slaughterhouses, finally breaking that city's long-held monopoly over the American meatpacking industry. Surprisingly, Burnham's wild scheme attracted considerable public and governmental support, particularly from Louisiana Congressman Robert Brossard, who saw it as an equally elegant solution to another ecological crisis, America's invasion by the water hyacinth plant. Native to the rivers of South America, water hyacinth was introduced to the United States at the 1884 Louisiana World Cotton Centennial Exposition, allegedly in the form of ornamental flowers handed out by the Japanese delegation. The plant, which grows rapidly into dense floating mats, spread like wildfire throughout the American Southeast, choking rivers and lakes, killing fish, and rendering entire waterways unnavigable. Efforts to curb the spread using saltwater spray, herbicides, and even spraying the plants with oil and setting them on fire all failed miserably, but Burnham's hippo scheme seemed at last to offer a practical solution. In addition to solving the meat crisis, the voracious beasts would also keep the aggressive invasive species in check, effectively killing two birds with one stone. Burnham also saw the scheme as an opportunity for the nation to reevaluate its destructive approach to agriculture and conservation and find a better way to move forward, urging his passage your audience to quote not make the same mistakes again this nation has reached a stage in its development where we should take stock of our assets and make full use of them in an intelligent manner so much of the continent has been left lonely silent devoid of life in any useful form and the hour of time is at hand when we can make use of it it is within our power to people it with useful and beautiful animals. While some commentators criticized the notion of hippo ranching as too outlandish and foreign for American tastes, Burnham was quick to point out that most common animals eaten by Americans – cattle, pigs, goats, sheep, and poultry – were all originally foreign species imported by European settlers. Only the passage of time has made them appear commonplace. Furthermore, plenty of equally exotic animals had already been imported into the country. In 1885, Englishman George Corson started an ostrich farm in Pasadena and made a fortune selling ostrich feathers for ladies' hats and other accessories, while in the 1850s, Secretary of War and future President of the Confederacy, Jefferson Davis, tried to introduce African camels to replace cavalry horses in the American Southwest. The animals proved ideally suited to the terrain, and only ridicule from older cavalrymen prevented the Camel Corps from taking off. The press heartily agreed with Burnham, with an editorial in the Washington Post arguing, Proposals which at first may look odd and chimerical to the mass of our readers will be seen to be matter-of-fact propositions when they become familiar. If we've learned to swallow raw oysters and suck the meat out of crabs, why can't we also embrace that plump and pull contiguous beast which has a smile like an old-fashioned fireplace? The New York Times extolled the virtues of the so-called lake cow bacon, while Lippincott's monthly magazine was almost rapturous in its praise of the scheme, writing of the hippo, this animal, homely as a steamroller, is the embodiment of salvation. Peace, plenty, and contentment lie before us, and a new life, with new experiences, new opportunities, new vision, new romance, folded in that golden future when the meadows and the byres of our southern lands shall swarm with herds of hippopotami. It's worth pointing out for any pedants in the audience that being derived from Greek, the plural of hippopotamus is hippopotamuses, and not hippopotami. The same actually goes for octopus, so now you know, and now, back to our story. To promote his scheme, Burnham formed a lobby group called New Food Supply Society. With help from Congressman Broussard, the group drafted House Resolution H.R. 23261, popularly known as the Hippo Bill, which sought to appropriate $250,000 in congressional funds for the importation of useful animals. On March 24, 1910, Burnham was invited to present his ideas before the House Committee on Agriculture. Testifying alongside Burnham were two men Broussard had invited to act as expert witnesses. The first was William Newton Irvin, fruit expert from the U.S. Department of Agriculture's Bureau of Plant Industry. A classic boffin character, Owen had a pension for championing ideas that were at once eccentric and strangely logical. Among his pet projects was a crusade to convert Americans from eating chicken eggs to eating turkey eggs, which he argued were larger, richer, more nutritious, and had a longer shelf life. Owen threw himself behind Burnham's hippo scheme with similar gusto, explaining to the House Committee, I hope to live long enough to see herds of these broad-backed beasts wallowing in the southern marshes and rivers, fattening on the millions of tons of food which awaits their arrival, to see great droves of white rhinoceri roaming over these semi-arid desert wastes, fattening on the sparse herbage which these lands offer, to see herds of the delicate giraffe, the flesh of which is the purest and sweetest of any known animal, browsing on the buds and shoots of young trees 
in preparation for the butcher's block. But the third man to testify that day was by far the oddest. A boer from the Cape Colony in what is now South Africa, Fritz Joubert Duquesne was in many ways Frederick Burnham's mirror image, a fellow larger-than-life soldier, spy, big-game hunter, and adventurer whom Burnham once called the human epitome of sin and deception. When, in 1900, the British Army in South Africa adopted a policy of scorched earth, burning down Boer farms, and herding their occupants into concentration camps, Duquesne developed a fanatical hatred for the British and vowed to kill as many occupying troops as possible. To this end, he became a scout, spy, and saboteur for the Boer republics, acquiring the certifiably badass but copyright infringing nickname of Black Panther. He and his opposite number, Frederick Burnham, soon developed a mutual admiration and fierce rivalry, and at one point were actually assigned to kill one another. For the moment, however, the two men were united in their curious crusade to introduce the hippo to North America. Fritz Duquesne's involvement in the hearings was thanks to another of Berman's fervent supporters, former U.S. President and ardent conservationist Theodore Roosevelt. In 1909, with his presidential term coming to an end, Roosevelt began planning an epic big-game hunting trip in East Africa and assembled a collection of experts to advise him on details such as stalking techniques and which firearms to bring along. Among these advisors was Duquesne, who impressed Roosevelt with his intimate knowledge of African wildlife. Duquesne brought this same expertise to bear in the March 1910 hearings, explaining to the committee members how easy it was to domesticate a hippo and how a young one could be fed milk from a bottle like a baby and led around on a leash like a pudgy hound. Hippos, he assured them, were not at all dangerous and produced delicious and nutritious meat on which his people had sustained themselves for generations. The committee seemed impressed, but as it was too late to introduce the hippo bill for that year's session of Congress, Broussard decided to wait until the following spring. In the meantime, Burnham would sail on a fact-finding expedition to Africa to choose the best species for importation and sort out the logistics of the massive transport operation. But Burnham never returned to Africa. The Mexican Revolution had just broken out, and his business partners called him away to help protect their investments along the Yaqui River. Meanwhile, the 1911 congressional session came and went, and while the New Food Supply Society held out hope that the hippo bill would soon be passed, Robert Broussard dithered, waiting for the ideal moment to introduce the bill to Congress. Then, in 1915, Broussard left Congress for the Senate, serving for three years before dying in April 1918. By this time, the United States' entry into the First World War had dramatically shifted the nation's priorities, and the hippo bill died a quiet, ignoble death, having never been debated by Congress. This was probably for the best, for as anyone who knows anything about African animals can tell you, hippos are most definitely not the harmless, docile creatures described in Fritz Duquesne's congressional testimony. Notoriously territorial and aggressive, hippos kill anywhere between 500 and 3,000 people in Africa every year, more than any other animal except the the mosquito. Ranching them for food would thus have been a highly dangerous proposition. Furthermore, the animals would most likely have been useless against the secondary problem they were intended to solve, the invasive water hyacinth. In the wild, hippos dine almost exclusively on Vossia cuspidata, or hippo grass, completely ignoring the abundant water hyacinth which has also taken over many regions of southern Africa. Thus, had Burnham's fanciful scheme actually come to fruition, the buyers of Louisiana would have gained nothing more than another aggressive invasive species. That Duquesne got these simple facts so absurdly wrong should come as no surprise, for apart from anything else, Fritz Duquesne was an inveterate liar, fraud, and con artist, spinning outlandish yarns and constantly reinventing himself to suit his own interests. During the First World War, Duquesne left America to become a spy and saboteur for Imperial Germany, later claiming responsibility for the death of British Secretary of State for War, Lord Herbert Kitchener. According to Duquesne, in June 1916, he snuck aboard the cruiser HMS Hampshire, which was transporting Kitchener to a meeting in Russia and signaled to a German U-boat which proceeded to torpedo the ship. However, this story is likely a complete fabrication as HMS Hampshire is known now to have struck a mine. In 1917, Duquesne returned to America only to find himself dropped from the lecture circuit as public interest in tales of African safaris evaporated. He thus reinvented himself as an Australian war hero, Captain Claude Strawton, and toured the country selling war bonds and regaling audiences with tales of his fictional wartime exploits. In November of that year, he was arrested in 
in New York and charged with espionage, arson, and murder on the high seas. While awaiting to be extradited to Britain, Duquesne feigned paralysis and was transferred to the prison ward of New York's Bellevue Hospital, where, on the 25th of May 1919, he succeeded in cutting through the bars of his cell and climbing over the wall to freedom. But the wily Black Panther wasn't finished yet. On June the 28th, 1941, Duquesne and 32 other spies were arrested on charges of funneling information on American weaponry to Nazi Germany. The so-called Duquesne spy ring was the largest espionage case in U.S. history and resulted in Duquesne and his conspirators being sentenced to a total of 300 years in prison. Fritz Duquesne served 14 before being released due to ill health in 1954. He died on May 24, 1956, at the age of 78. Returning to our story, you may have noticed that there are, in fact, no hippopotamuses wading through the byres of Louisiana, and that hippo steaks and burgers are not staples of the American diet. So how then did America finally manage to solve the meat shortage that inspired Frederick Burnham's outlandish scheme in the first place? The solution turned out to be a rather mundane one. Rather than diversify the types of animals eaten, American farmers simply converted previously unproductive lands like swamps and byres into grazing pasture and found ways of packing that land with greater and greater numbers of livestock. This eventually developed into the industrial farming methods of today, which, while incredibly productive, are responsible for all sorts of environmental ills from waste runoff and algae blooms to antibiotic-resistant bacteria. And even 140 years after its introduction, water hyacinth continues to plague American waterways, with the state of Louisiana alone spending $2 million per year to keep the invasive plant under control. So perhaps a biofill of aggressive hippos would not have been the worst outcome after all. But while the 1910 hippo scheme might seem like a bonkers proposition for us today, it does offer a fascinating glimpse into the optimism and can-do attitudes that characterized early 20th century America. As author John Mualem writes in his 2013 article American Hippopotamus there is something beautiful about the America that considered importing them, an America so intent on facing down its problems and solving them that even an idea like this could get a fair hearing. Where the political system and the culture felt so alive with possibility and so confident in its own virtue and ingenuity that elected officials could sit around and contemplate the merits of hippo ranching without worrying too much about how it sounded. Where people felt free and bold enough to imagine putting hippopotamuses in places where there were no hippopotamuses. So I hope you found this video interesting. If you did, please do hit that thumbs up button below. Don't forget to subscribe and thank you for watching.